Hello and welcome to the Artists Make Money podcast, where you'll find real talk about that scary topic, money. I'm your host, Vivian Egan. I'm an interactive theatre and comedy producer, podcaster and freelance business writer. I'm on a mission to get the arts industry talking more about money. Today's guest is Charlotte Peters, a freelance theatre and, since COVID, film director. I really appreciated how honest she was about feeling not very good with money and I think that's something a lot of creatives will resonate with. Um, We talked a lot about money and privilege too, as well as the experience of collective organising to advocate for fair pay. Um, So I think you'll really enjoy what Charlotte has to say. This episode of Artists Make Money is brought to you by our friends at Side Hustle Sites. They make designer flat pack websites, like the IKEA of websites, uh, with helpful instructions and guides for how to make your website look really great. It is cheaper than Squarespace and their templates are actually specialized to particular jobs. So they've got templates for theater professionals and for freelance writers. I'm actually about to use them to build my freelance writing website because I don't have one. Um, Or they can actually design you a website from scratch, which they did for me on the Artists Make Money website. If you sign up via sidehustle-sites.com slash AMM, I will link that in the show notes. You will get a fantastic professional looking website and your first month subscription free and the second month half price. That is just for Artists Make Money listeners. On with the show. Hi Charlotte, welcome to the Artists Make Money podcast. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. I'm pushing through. (laughs) (laughs) That's what we've got to do. Yeah. Um, So I will start with the question I ask all my guests first, and that is, how do you make your money? Uh, I make, well, in normal times. um, Yeah, that might be a two-part question. Yeah, exactly. So um, I was making my money all from stage direction. And in the last year that has moved from stage to also some film, live stream, online production stuff. Currently, I am also teaching piano via Zoom and occasionally drama teaching and doing quite a lot of dramaturgy at the moment as well. Wow. So you you were able to very quickly sort of realign your um, your income um it well the piano teaching literally I think it was the first day all the theatres closed I realized that I needed some money coming in so I put something out on Facebook and just I taught in my early 20s but not for a while so that happened quite quickly I got like I think seven students within a, a couple of weeks and I've had them pretty much I think one or two have shifted but most I've had them for the whole year which has been really nice oh. Um, And then the film stuff kind of happened almost as a happy accident. The first thing I did was on Twitter, there was something, uh, a really brilliant initiative called the Coronavirus Theatre Club. And they used to, well, I don't know if they still do, they might do, um, have monologues that went up each week. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did a monologue uh, with my kind of business partner in crime, Lana Wallace-Taylor, who we run a little company together, Brick Dust. So we did that and I really enjoyed that. And then I think I must have done some readings on Zoom, like back when Zoom was un- under the radar, like um, when it was first kind of being discovered by people, I suppose. And I think I started doing some readings. I can't really remember, but I was very lucky and got a phone call from Alistair Watley, at original theatre company who I'd worked with quite a bit in the past, who said that they were thinking about doing a re-adaptation of Birdsong, which is something that Alistair and I have worked on for many years. Um, And did I, you know, kind of want to be involved in co-directing it for the kind of Zoomy type audience? And it just totally got out of control. It started as a Zoom reading. And by the end, it was a fully fledged, completely production designed, full costume, full makeup thing, which we filmed using people's iPhones, but which went over... Uh, which kind of almost took a Zoom environment on occasion and had like the two boxes next to each other, but which was properly edited by Tristan Shepard, a brilliant editor. And then we put that out there. And from there, I've done lots of other stuff um, yes. since. And we've done something together as well, which is very yes. interesting. Um, yes, exactly. Also quite a long time ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it, it is almost exactly a year. And we were realising how quickly... So uh, we, it was a play that my partner had written and that we had talked about in pre-corona times. And then 
we realized that two of the actors who had done it was a two-hander two actors had done it a reading together and that they were in the same house so we we're like okay let's get on this and um that felt really good I I felt at the time because it felt like such a kind of you know immediate kind of all right we've got to do something we've got to focus on something to take our mind off all this other stuff and and yeah. also just like kind of a, a proof of concept really of of doing stuff streaming theater uh, that's it and it was on twitch and i'd never heard of twitch um which obviously feels very old and technophobic but i hadn't and since then have kind of been doing odd bits and pieces on there so yeah it's it was it was i thought i really enjoyed doing that and it was so nice to be creative and you know now by this point of having done quite a lot on screen for the last year when i get up i do some short films now which i didn't do before which are actually in person um and that is amazing because i do like everybody else get screen fatigue having not looked at my laptop all day every day before and having you know had a long period during the last year where I have been doing it it's been really nice to do some other stuff um but yeah it was it's it was really good to have that and to have those projects as kind of a way of uh creatively mm. trying not to think about everything else yeah and so the thing that we did that was we did that on a profit share model and so what were the other you know were you doing profit share were you getting paid a fee so the very first thing that I mentioned the Twitter monologue that was just like a free monologue we rehearsed it for like a few hours in fact we were rehearsing that at the same time we were doing the ultimatum game which is uh, the show that Viv and I did um uh and that yeah that was free but actually everything else I think has been paid because um Oh, yeah, with the exception of one project, which I was co-producing. So it was kind of a, a project which I, you know, obviously had a real investment in. But uh, quite early on, I was doing a lot of readings, you know, readings for free, you know, just sharing work. And I think I just got to the point where uh, you've got to kind of give as much as you get um, and you've got to get as much as you give. And I think... I didn't want to be in a position where I felt I was getting like migraines, which I do get from being on the screen all the time as a result of kind of doing work, which perhaps couldn't go on like a CV or couldn't enrich me artistically um, if there was no money. <laughs> so, you know, and also literally on a completely, you know, honest level, my husband works as an actor and writer and he, he um, usually gets paid like a salary from his limited company. Um, that comes but his money really comes from like loads of people's limited company like the dividends so that excuses him from the government schemes I think he gets a tiny bit on furlough but it's it's really small I had worked for the National Theatre for 18 months um, just before this all happened and they put me on their PAYE so even though I was a freelancer because I was on PAYE that took my income down from HMRC's self-employment perspective really low mm. so actually like it got to a point where I had to be taking the work that could literally help us pay the mortgage <laughs> and mm. pay the bills yeah. Um, so yeah so I, I, yeah, I was very lucky. I really do. I, I am very, very aware that I was very lucky. Um, and, you know, some stuff, I'm not saying I got paid a fortune for things, but, uh, but actually with um, Arts Council funding, which I'd got an individual grant for, and the little bit I got from the government, I ended up like miraculously um, being in a position by the end of 2020 where I'd earned what I would have earned otherwise. And that was also because of two stage projects that I did as well at Christmas well actually one was stage and one was a live live streamed green screen using Unreal Engine amazing interactive pantomime which is on Easter if anyone's listening with kids you can go on to Pante Live cheeky little plug there um but yeah so I I feel so fortunate this year is very different but last year mm. I felt very lucky yeah right and and so you were saying so you were on the PAYE for national um and had that been so how used to you uh sort of piecing together your income yeah. from all these different streams have, have you been or is this kind of a new thing um so previously I was generally self-employed I mean when I started out like so many I was doing things to be able to afford to be a director so mm -hmm. I did some secretarial work at a law firm and I ran a, a brilliant education department at Theatre Royal Windsor um and taught piano and taught drama and ran two youth theatres and that was all alongside kind of being able to afford to put my own shows on on the like the London Fringe and Edinburgh Fringe but that was like 10 years ago so for the I would say for a good kind of six years seven years steadily I was doing just self-employed freelance work and that was all directing so actually it became 
not stable because it's still project based, but an even income from that. Mm -hmm. And then um, the national slightly, you know, put me in a difficult position. They did give us the choice between being freelance or being PAYE. And I, th I did like three contracts with them. And um, this was uh, associate directing Warhorse. And previously, I think I'd opted for freelance, but actually had seen colleagues of mine getting odd bits and pieces. I'm trying to remember because it's so long ago now and I'm so rubbish with money. But I think there was, we're not proper employees, but you do get something like holiday pay when the shows are off. Whereas of course you don't get that as a freelancer. So I thought, oh yeah, well, if they really want me to go on PAYE, which they very much did, um, then next time I'll get a little bit of money from those weeks off. But obviously, had I anticipated this, I definitely wouldn't have done that because it really, you know, it's the thousands of pounds worth of difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it, it's made a huge difference. And I, I hadn't really thought of any of those consequences because, of course, who does? And at the time, you're just trying to make the best decision for the now, um, which is still what I do, you know, like everybody kind of live hand to mouth, don't really have any savings. But, you know, you just try and make the choices that you think are sensible at the time. Mm. Well, um, speaking of, you mentioned just earlier, which I wanted to ask you about, your mortgage, you and your actor husband were able to buy a house. Tell us about the process of being yeah. buying a house. Well, I have to preface, uh, uh, what's the word? I have to say on this that I would never be in a position on my own to be able to buy um I just don't, I just don't know in what world I ever would have been able to, but um, my husband actually in some kind of miraculous world created something theatrical that was also very commercial, which is what all of us dream and aspire to do. And it took, you know, 10 years of hard slog, but they, for the last five years, you know, reaped the rewards. So him and his double act partner created a series of shows called Potted etc so the potted potter was the main one and you know they've been so lucky because they've traveled the world and been off broadway and the show is due to reopen in vegas hopefully soon um and so through potted potter and potted panto and a few other ventures like that he bought a flat in london which was just amazing and he is aware of how lucky he is um, probably because i say it quite a lot <laughs> um, so uh yeah so he bought a flat in london and then when we talked about moving out I live in Margate now so it's seaside and we talked about moving out of London and um and yeah so we I mean I don't really know how it works if I'm honest because I can't remember in the end there were lots of different options what I started to worry about was that I'd almost bring make us worse when we were applying for a mortgage because my situation is unstable and I think in the end they did take into account my income as well but for a little while there was discussions which is really demoralizing when you've worked for 15 years and slogged your guts out and on your CV you're kind of proud of what you've done mm. when you know a financial advisor says well we might have to hide what you do because it might make you less attractive to a mortgage advisor a mortgage broker but actually I don't think that happened in the end I think it was fine because I'd had a st steady stream of income for a few years so I think both of our names are in this house I feel like I should know this stuff I mean god forbid if something happened but anyway so yeah so we what we ended up doing I say we Jeff because it's his flat but we ended up remortgaging that flat and then releasing equity to pay for this house and we now have people tenants in who rent that flat so the flat looks after itself which is fantastic and I manage that like that's my little contribution to our to our financial situation and our, our marriage is that I, I manage the flat as the landlady and then we bought this house um yes yeah, so I pay I pay the mortgage I pay my half of the mortgage but I you know was able to buy it literally because of a man which is yeah tricky but, um, <laughs> but I have I've dealt with that <laughs> yeah totally uh yeah I mean it's just kind of like it's the hand you're dealt right it's like you know, it would be different if you chose him because he had a success. That is true. That is true. That is true. I did not do that. Yeah. No, yeah, you are, you know, you are, it is the hand you're dealt. And I think I, I feel very, very lucky that I do the job I do. Um, and it is tricky, particularly in creative roles. I would say there is a real issue with what, perhaps directors are paid and associate directors and resident directors and assistant directors in comparison to 
more production-y jobs. I mean, like we're, we've always been taught to be very quiet about money, but actually in the last few years, myself and colleagues have been a bit more open about it so that we can try and fight to get more collectively. And, you know, I've got sound engineer friends who technically, you know, as, as a director of something like Warhorse, there's about 90 people on the team. 36 on stage and everyone else off stage and you are responsible for that you know if you're if you're associate director of that show on the road if we don't have understudies everyone covers each other if people are off so if you've got six people are off I've had a, I've had that phone call from the producers saying do you think we can do the show or will we have to cancel the show and you know that by cancelling the show that's hundreds of thousands of pounds that's being lost mm. so it you, you have this responsibility and I sometimes do find it tricky that if you look at the hours and the days and you split it all up, that directors are paid much less than most mm. of our counterparts, you know, most of the engineers and most of the, um, I don't know, I mean, lots, even I, I was on a job and we, we discovered the stage management and the actors were on much more than we were, you know, it, if you count the hours, I'm not talking about the whole fee, but I'm saying, you know, we do not, we're not able to put it to bed when we go home because we're having to still look after it in so many ways. So that's difficult for sure. But generally, sorry, I've been just talking and not even thinking about the question, but generally I would say, yeah, I do feel lucky. Yeah, no, that that's what this is all about you talking. So please. Please talk. I know, I'm such a waffler. I'm such a, a rambler and a waffler. It's fine. I'm I'm curious about how this sort of more collective action looks. Like, are you? Is it informal? Are you just kind of chatting? Are you talking about unions? Are you like, what's? The yeah, it is. It's sorry, my door just opened, and to <laughs> say the dog coming in, I'm just shooting. Yeah, it is. Um, it is informal. I I am actually on the equity directors and designers committee because I I kept talking to um, friends of mine about about this situation and it, they put me in touch with equity, who I was a member of anyway, um, and started talking to equity about all the different directing roles because it's quite complicated. Mm. All these different directing roles and what they come under and how it should work payment wise. And just thought, actually, I, you know, there's no point talking about this constantly. I should do something. So I am on that committee. And so we, we do do a lot of work to um, try and make things much fairer. But also, I, I was talking more just then about more of an informal thing where, you know, um, particularly with the Warhorse family or with a show that's like Warhorse. And I, I, you know, there's a few that I've kind of been attached to where it is quite useful to just share that. I mean, I'm sure the producers wouldn't want us to, but it is useful to do that because then we can try and see whether the model is fair mm. and also whether, you know, what is being judged in order of payment. Sometimes I do think, you know, if someone has a particular level of experience, they probably are going to get paid a bit more. And I, I have no issue with that. What strikes me as very difficult is when you weigh people up and you can't see any differences apart from the paycheck. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's good to kind of share those things. And certainly through Warhorse, myself and my colleagues have managed to get everybody within the creative team better paid through saying to the national this isn't you know we, we don't think this is fair and the national quite rightly you know they're the, particularly national theater productions which is the kind of commercial leg who produce warhorse or produced warhorse they you know they from their perspective they're saying well we pay in line with the rest of the industry mm. and you go okay yeah that's that's I do understand that. I think the difficulty is with some shows and Warhorse is one of them, what you have to do outside of the onstage aspect is so much more extensive mm. that you can't just compare the fee to a standard directing job. Yeah. So I think that it's really important that we are more open with each other about what we get paid. And I, you know, I certainly don't feel any shame or, and, you know, I don't, I don't earn enough money to feel shame and I don't, um, and I, I don't earn too little that I feel like I can't look after myself. So therefore I feel like it's right to kind of share and yeah. Mm, yeah, definitely. And like, you know, when you say, if you say in line with the rest of the industry, the industry is very uneven. Yeah. And when you're the national theatre making a lot of money from a, a blockbuster show like Warhorse, then I think, you know, there's a little bit of an onus, right, to yeah you treat your your people really well I think I think that's right I mean I think in many ways they they do like when we were put on 
when we're sent around the country, we get put in nice hotels, you know, things that it, I definitely felt like it was a real step up working for the National mm-hmm. and Warhorse because whereas previously I'd been given a little budget to go and stay somewhere and usually it was like a, a travel lodge or somewhere, you know, they sort all that out for you and you're in pretty nice places. Mm-hmm. But I think, and, and when you make them understand it, when when they understand the amount of hours you're putting in, they are pretty good and they do get it. It's just, it's it's we have a real issue within the industry that if you have um a job an engineer type job that is i believe that is seen as a higher level of skill set than creative jobs which Mm -hmm. i think the maybe the um opinion is is that there are loads of creatives so we can generally pay them less i'm not i'm not attributing that opinion to the national i'm saying i think that is an industry-wide issue that we have and i think it's it takes a lot of fighting from uh, places like Equity and Stage Directors UK and other fantastic um, kind of associative bodies to to try and remind um, producers and you know producer guilds that yes that might be how it's always been but that doesn't make it fair and and certainly like the role of the director for instance has changed so dramatically in the last hundred years so I think you know there's a lot of work to be done in trying to make things fairer. Mm. Well, I mean, well done for like actually taking some steps instead of being like, this sucks. And then, not well, I did do this sucks for a while, but also, you know, I'm not, I certainly, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm like a leading activist. I just play a little role I'm on a very, very good committee with some brilliant peers. So I just, I feel, you know, again, I feel quite lucky and privileged to be put in a position where I can. And we all come from different backgrounds. So we're able to really share mm. our experiences and they're all really um, wide ranging. Lovely. Um, what is something you wish someone had told you 10 years ago about like managing your money as an artist or valuing your time as an artist? Something to do with money. <laughs> I wish that I had listened when people had told me to put money away separately for tax oh. because every time I've been stumped out by that. I mean, I just don't, I just don't learn. I just don't learn year to year. Every year I get a shock from the tax bill and every year I end up having to like find money from here and there. So um, yeah, definitely. I I wish I I wish I'd shouted loud or listened more on that one. Um, I think that 10 years ago, I probably had the opinion that if I keep working really hard and I start to get the really good jobs on my CV, that I will not have to worry about money anymore. And I think that the sad truth is that as a creative in this industry, you know, I think it's slightly different with film, but um, certainly within theatre, you kind of always have to worry about it because even the people we aspire to be are not making nearly as much money as, you know, people in other industries. So I think... I have learned that money has absolutely nothing to do with my validation as a human being. And I think probably 10 years ago, I wasn't so aware of that because I saw a lot of my friends 15 years ago go into amazing graduate jobs and 10 years ago would be able to throw money here, there and everywhere. And I thought one day I'm going to be like them and I just need to work a bit harder and actually just doesn't really work like that. Mm. Well, that's a great thing to have learned. I think it's really hard to unravel because because of the all of the capitalism that surrounds us like and the messaging of like you are what you earn pretty much like your yeah. value as a human is almost you know seems to be directly correlated with how much financial stability you have yeah. it can be very very hard to like go no it's okay i have value beyond my bank balance like that's that's like a long journey for sure I think you're absolutely right and I also think that I come from a privileged position where if god forbid something happened I could borrow money from my husband or from my father or from you know there are people in my life I am very aware of the circumstances in which I grew up which meant I could do this job I do now at no point have I been given handouts at no point I've always done everything I can you know secretarial work and all sorts of other things to earn and I haven't had to ask but knowing that that is there has definitely meant you know that I've been able to make choices that people from other socioeconomic backgrounds wouldn't be able to make. And I feel incredibly grateful for that. And I am very, very aware of it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think that's absolutely right. So um, I think that is an important thing. And I also think that I could just switch, switch jobs, you know, like I, on my little flirtation with live stream work in this kind of environment I did work where I made this kind of green screen panther. I mean, 
the money I was on, I kind of had this funny situation where they said a figure and I was like, I had to play it really cool because <laughs> they were like, oh, is that going to be okay? And I was like, oh yeah, I, you know, I think, I think I can, I think I can make that work. But I, I mean, it was like twice the amount I normally get for anything. So yeah, it's, it's, so, you know, it's made me think, well, actually I could probably work a bit less hard if I did a few more of those jobs. And I definitely would love to try and, as we all would find a few more of those jobs, but I could also quit this tomorrow and go back to secretarial work. I mean, as a legal secretary, I did that for two years and I was by the end. No, I mean, I did it on and off for 15 years, but I did it full time for two years just to save up money to do this. And, um, you know, by the end, I think I was on and this was like over 10 years ago. I was I was earning over 30 grand as a legal secretary. And I, you know, I, don't, I think I've earned 30 grand gross maybe once, but I maybe once, you know, I, I don't mind being a bit more open and specific I think my sal my earnings for a year gross fall somewhere between like the 22 and 28 mm. um, depending on the year and I'm very happy with that because I can do everything I need to within that money mm. um, but apart from save I can't really save but um but I can do everything else and I feel you know very pleased but if I quit this and went to be a legal secretary and did that for longer or if I did my piano teaching full-time yeah. I mean, I'd be laughing, but I wouldn't be fulfilled. Um, and this, I've learned that my work is kind of part of, is, uh, it sounds a bit pathetic, but like if we spend all these hours working, right? For me personally, like, that has to have a purpose and it has to have a drive. And, um, and I know I need that. I know I need to like tick boxes within myself in order to feel fulfilled. So I'd rather sacrifice the money as long as I can afford to live. Um, and do what I do then then give it up which you know is another option yeah totally I always think about um when I was at uni I had a boyfriend whose dad was a film director and he said to me one time don't go into this industry if there is anything else that you can do <laughs> and I was like noted <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean and you know people put people off all the time I mean I I kind of say the same thing to young people um you know you do end up giving that advice and you get that I mean all the time my parents wanted me to do anything but work in theatre yeah. um you know they really did and everyone said to me just do you know just do anything else just learn you know even now on occasion my uh it's been fine for years and my parents never said anything and then because of coronavirus and you know income changing my dad went you could go back to the idea of running your own stage school and he can't help it it's because he wants his daughter to have financial security and it's something he'd suggested to me like 15 years ago and we looked into briefly until I realized I wasn't doing it for me at all mm. uh, uh, you know but he can't help but say that because our job this does not give us financial security mm. you know we, we have to be very very lucky to be able to feel we can pay all our bills and that that's there is something wrong with that I do feel there's something wrong with that because I think we give something to society not in the same way I'm not trying to compare us to key workers but I'm, I, I think you know entertainment is a really credible and important part of society and we contribute to that we give to that um often at the sacrifice of you know friends weddings or you know family occasions or whatever mm. um but yes I think I think that is the advice that's often given and I, I I personally think you can do it for a bit and then you can quit if you want to and you can come back to it I think the main thing that people say I'm trying to choose what I do with my life and I say well just don't do that just yeah. choose what you want to do for a bit because I think that we have evolved in terms of no longer having one career path yeah yeah absolutely I mean yeah because I I spend the majority of my time particularly in the last year like writing <laughs> I write blog posts and ebooks for like startups and banks. <laughs> but I, and I also really enjoy that. But as you say, it's not the thing that really fulfills, like it engages me kind of mentally. I feel like interested and challenged, but not in the same way as like, you know, when, when we sit down to a meeting to talk about a show to work on. Yeah. Like, oh, ideas. Yes. There's, and you get that spark and you get that like, real x factor and it's yeah. like there's nothing else like it and I think that's what um what my ex-boyfriend's dad meant it was like if you can like hat stomach doing anything yeah like, but like if you if you can't handle not having this in your life yeah. like you you have to 
Yeah, and sometimes, right, it's really nice. Oh, the door keeps opening, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to shut it again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's really, really nice to actually um, do other things. Like, oh, my God, like on the odd occasion where I've gone and done, like, temping. Like when I used to work at the law firm, it was like the best novelty ever. So I'd go to work every day and I'd be like, oh, just mm-hmm. driving to work. And, oh, I'm going to buy my sandwich for lunch. And I'd have a gossip with everyone. And do you know what? I loved that. I loved, pl- I felt like I was playing a part in yes. some ways. I've never had stability. Yeah. And I, I, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I, I also loved nobody asking me for the answers. Like I worked for people and I really enjoyed getting my head down, problem solving, typing things up and being left in my own little bubble to do that. And, um, and I gained so much from the people I met, you know, the other secretaries and the lawyers I worked with, they were all such beautiful, brilliant people. And so many of them will come and see my shows now, which is really mm. nice and will stay in touch and, you know, but the trouble was, is that the novelty wore off for me and for w- the difference between myself and the people, the other people who worked there was they, they felt the they felt a sense of real satis- job satisfaction as did I briefly but the trouble is I think the way that I'm wired means that I need to I need to be kind of creating something or do in order to to tick those boxes for myself and the other difference is is that pe- work-life balance right and some people are able to kind of really have a fantastic work-life balance where they might do a job that they don't love but outside they you know they can just have the best time and you know and if I I think if I I have a really amazing life but I think I have a really amazing life as a result of the job I do as well Mm -hmm. so I'm my work-life balance is way better because I I I'm I I really do hugely value my life outside of work and I see I do see directing as a job now as opposed to my life which previously it was Mm -hmm. but I think it's just what makes you tick and how you work and so yeah whilst I do still get like if on the odd occasion someone phones me and says can you type this up or can you do this or I'm really short today I'll be like yeah and I really get into it but um, sadly you know I tried to I tried to do it for a while to save money and I think with hindsight if I'd have done it for another four years I would have earned tons you know but I just couldn't do it I just couldn't do it I had to I had to stop yeah cost of that yeah for me yeah for me absolutely there was a real cost but I mean I really um, admire and respect all the amazing people who do those jobs because a they a lot of them get huge amounts out of them and b some of them don't need to get loads out of their work because they because they they can do that outside in their life it's just I'm just not wired that way my attention span is one of the issues I'm just not able to focus for long enough on one thing to be able to get through a day day after day for a year totally <laughs> I absolutely hear you yeah um so you, you've mentioned several times that you don't save or you, you don't feel like you can save. Mm. Um, what are your like financial goals though? Um, I would definitely like to be able to save money. I mean, I did last year, I did manage to save because I was doing this work. And like I say, cause I was very lucky and I, I can't remember what I earned, but it was around what I would have earned anyway, or around what I'd earned the previous year. And, but my outgoings were way less, right? Because I obviously had my mortgage and bills to pay, but I wasn't going out. Mm. Um, and actually spending money on theater is one of the, my biggest costs. And I wasn't able to do any of that. So I saved um, 8,000 pounds, which was huge. But then the tax bill for seven and a half thousand pounds came out. <laughs> so gutted. Because again, I just hadn't thought about it. And I was so like, oh my God, I know what I'm going to do with this money. Because for my husband's 40th, I really, the plan was to take him to New Orleans and we'd go and we'd go to Mardi Gras. And it was like this amazing thing. So I was like, right, I transferred that eight grand I'd saved into a savings account. It was like, this is it. We're going to have the best time. And, you know, and yeah, I'm going to need to dip into that here and there. You know, but I, I stupidly assumed that in 2021, when I had some really amazing projects lined up this year, those would all happen, which they haven't. Um, and um, and then I stupidly forgot that a big tax bill would come. And to be fair, HMRC did say we didn't have to pay it there and then, but mm. I had that money. And thank God I did do that because I don't have that money now. And I don't, I don't see any way before the end of the year of having any money. Mm. Um, I've actually been applying to... Uh, funding pe- places because because I've lost everything this year all my income's gone mm. so I'm doing like I said I'm doing teaching which is great and that kind of covers groceries and bits and pieces that we need and to be honest like wine 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I've been like angelic. I'm not very good with money in that um, I don't, you know, there are some people who can be really careful and I'm not that person. I make sure I, I can, you know, I can look after myself, but I will let myself go in the red briefly if I need to have a good time. And then I'll just make sure I have a frugal couple of weeks. But, um, but yeah, so, and then the dramaturgy work, which is fine and great, but it doesn't pay huge amounts. And in a lot of the cases with dramaturgy work, that's attached to shows that will happen. So I'll get paid the money then. Mm. Um, and that's tough. That's really tough. So I've, yeah, I've been applying for stuff recently. Um, but yeah, apart from this year, I haven't ever been able to save. I think my financial goals would be, I would love to feel like I actually owned somewhere. Um, even if that's with my husband, but to actually feel like it's not just me paying the mortgage, I could, I could in my own right be seen as grown up enough to have whatever they need on my bank statements to be able to buy something. Mm. So I would really like that. I would like to, if we have children, um, I'd like to be able to feel like there's not an issue with being able to afford our kids, you know, yeah. what they need. So I think my financial goals are continued stability and and to be able to save, to be honest. And and if I'm really, really honest, I could sit down with somebody and save more money than I have done and that I do. I, I'm sure, because I, I don't really look after my money properly. Um, I definitely could do that, uh, but I haven't. And that, that, again, says something about the privileged well you know world that I'm living in right now that I haven't felt I really need to do that Mm. Um, and also probably that oh my god the door oh no this time it's my husband um but yeah and also (laughs) also probably that I um what was I saying oh yeah I haven't felt the need and also yeah because money isn't that important and actually I it is of course it's important but I am not somebody who's into designer things I'm not someone who needs to go to every music festival. I, you know, actually in terms of my outgoings and what I spend, like I say, I spend a lot of it on theatre and a lot of it on travel to see people. But I live, like my kind of day-to-day spendings are on the cheapest versions of things. Mm. Um, So that, you know, so that does help as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you you keep on saying... I'm really bad at money, but like, you don't actually sound that bad to me. Like- I mean, I think I'll tell you some examples. Here we go. Here's some examples. I never check my bank statement and I got an email. This is a really good example of how terrible I am. I got an email about two weeks ago from my car insurance people saying they were about to renew. And I said to my husband, I thought, don't you do the car insurance? And I do like various other bits. Um, And he was like, yeah, I think so. And I said, well, Admiral have just emailed me um, about it. And he was like, well, just double check it. So I go into it and it's a car that I sold like a year and a half ago. (laughs) I had been paying for the car insurance and that is not cheap. It was 535 pounds. It was going to cost to renew it. So even though I am not in a position to save and I normally have less than a thousand pounds in my bank account day to day, I had managed to not be aware that 535 pounds had come out of my account last year. And I phoned them and I explained the whole thing and they were delightful. But the guy said, just if you don't mind my asking, how did you not realize? And I said, I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know. Because I'm really bad and I don't check. And like that sort of thing. And quite often the people I teach are like, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to pay you last week. And I'm like, I I never check. So (laughs) you could have been having lessons for free for a year. And I went, you know, and the times when I check are when um, I get a little text from my phone that says, you have less than 20 pounds. I think I get a notification less than 200, a notification less than 20. So I check then. And sometimes I get a very nasty surprise um and my credit card bill might get paid a bit late but um but yeah generally I'm, that's why I'm bad because I'm just not aware of what I'm spending um yeah I I used to be a never check my bank account person and then I just made myself do it every day like I set a goal and I didn't end up I was like I'm gonna do it every day for a month and I didn't but I did manage to do it more yeah and to be honest I don't think I check that much even now but I have been earning a little bit more money because I've upped the um, the amount of like freelance business writing that I've been doing. So I'm no, I know that there's enough in yeah. there. So I 
I, yeah so I'm like same <laughs> yeah it's it's bad it's like I mean normally I'm a bit more aware of it because I'll have to get cash out and it will say but actually the last year I mean things just come out and I use my little contactless phone thing that's what is for everything so you know it's it's also the times when I check it when I have to invoice people because that's the other thing I'm terrible at I forget to invoice or I don't keep my travel receipts and then I end up not being able to claim travel I mean it's just really stupid stuff because I can have a month where I'm like I can't believe I've got like less than zero in my account and how am I going to cope and then I have to phone around um, and see if I can get some extra bits and pieces and generally it's because two months before that I didn't invoice for something or I invoiced late. And so that money's not coming yet, or I lost the travel receipt, you know, it's, it's so it's stuff that I could absolutely fix. And a lot of people, you know, my position would have to fix it because they would never be able to, if they got below zero, you know, I'm like I keep saying, I'm really, really aware that this makes me sound really privileged. Um, but also, it also just means I don't really, I'm not someone who worries if I'm in my overdraft. Or I'm not someone who worries if I can't pay my bill for one, you know, because I know that I will be able to, because I know I have a steady enough stream. And, and I just never let money worry me. I just mm. can't, I just, it's for me, like I just can't be in that position because there are too many other things I worry about. I'm neurotic enough <laughs> about worrying about how much I'm earning or whatever. Yeah. Um, did you... Have you inherited any sort of um, beliefs about money from your family, your parents, your upbringing? I think, yeah, I think I've inherited like a serious work ethic, which probably is tied in with that. I definitely in terms of, it, yeah, in terms of weirdly, so my dad, my dad is um, kind of completely self-made. And by that, I mean, he grew up in a, uh, like he grew up in a house. I think he, both he and my mum would say that they're like, their parents were like uh, working class. If we're talking about class, I know people don't really, but like, I think they both would say that. Um, and, you know, they had no savings, particularly his parents. His parents loved to spend money on like the dogs and the horses. So anything they had, they were just saying, whereas my mum, her parents would save everything. And would go on these amazing holidays once every however many years, because they just worked and worked and worked and saved and saved and saved. Um, and I think my dad felt that he wanted a different lifestyle. So he and I differ in that because he does. My dad absolutely likes the finer things in life. And so he worked in a job he hated for 35 years. He was a solicitor mm. and he really, really realized like in the first week, this is not for me, but didn't feel he had any choice but to pursue that. Oh, yeah. um, and so did a job. And he's been working as a property developer for the last kind of 15 years for a while he did both so he could afford to do both and then he retired from law and just did property and that he gets a real kick out of he really loves that side of it but you know he did that because he wanted to have a nice house and he wanted to be, you know he wanted certain things his values were linked to that so work ethic wise i think was similar he's also like the most both my parents are like the most generous people ever and i like to think that i have been influenced by that in terms of charity giving and you know if if I'm out with someone and they can't afford something, but I could see that they want to have that, you know, I just, I just want to, I just want to be able to enable it. Mm. Um, and my, yeah, my parents, I think, so yeah, work ethic wise, not in terms of wanting all the things, who knows, maybe that will change, but I certainly like my dad and I differ in terms of that, but in terms of what I think my dad and my mom feel incredibly lucky to have like the life they have now, which is not, you know, loads, they rent their house at the moment, they're hoping to buy somewhere, but they, you know, they are in a really comfortable position. And as a result, they, they give back to the community, um, both in time and money. And, um, and that's something that is really important to me is, is charity and, and donations and giving back. And, and actually, recently, I've just been thinking that I have some time and I can do more. So yeah, so I think yes, yes and no. <laughs> nice. Um... I suppose this is a similar kind of question, but I'm wondering if it would have a different answer. Do you have any money hang-ups? Uh, like what? What do you mean? What sort of? So, like, for example, um, I asked um, someone else this question and he was like, yes, I, like, I still believe that, and you know, he's a man, but I still believe that, like, a man should be able to provide for his, like, wife and children, even okay. though I know that that's wrong. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, the things that annoy me when it comes to money 
I get very annoyed if somebody is not as generous as they could be mm. in an environment or a situation. And that might be, I'm trying to think of an example. That might be, for instance, where I have, you know, uh, some of my uni friends or school friends have gone to have incredibly high powered jobs in like Deloitte and those sorts of places. Mm. And there have been situations where we've all gone out for dinner. Mm. And um, I've also had some like actor friends and other friends who have been in between work. And I sometimes like, I, I have arrangements with lots of my really close friends where it's like, I'll get this one, you get the next one. And just we're even all let's split that. Let's, and we just don't split hairs. And, and I know when you're younger, you are much more aware of what's in the bill and you itemize it. Mm. But I, yeah, I would say I get very angry when I see friends that I, that are friends. So that they're, they're friends of mine for a reason. And I can see that they are counting every single thing they've paid for when there are other people sitting around that table who, um, who are just not in a position that they're in. So I get annoyed with that. So I guess it's like tight tightness as it were. I get very angry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was something else I thought of when you said that story and I can't remember, I can't remember now what it was. Um, yeah, I would say that's it. And then I also get a bit like, it's similarly with not like necessarily char all charity things, but I do feel like I, f I do feel, I don't know if this is a socialist view, but I, I feel like we have a duty to give back the excess of, I'm not saying we shouldn't save, we absolutely should save, mm. but there are always people, well, in most cases there are always people who are less fortunate than us. And I, f and, and I think that we have a responsibility to give back to our communities, um, to people who just don't have the opportunity to have what we have. And so it annoys me when I, speak to people or when people go oh, yeah I've always thought about that and I and and I'm, I'm not talking about people in our industries or people who um don't have a lot of money I'm talking about people who do have who have money to spare mm. and yet would rather keep it for themselves so I think selfishness I suppose when it comes to mm. money is something that I really think about and and actively sometimes I'm so aware of that I end up going too far the other way and people are like, what are you doing? You can't buy that. Like you've just bought the round. You can't buy the other round. Like, you know, I've had friends go, you're still doing the same job, right? Like, what are you, what are you doing? And then I'll get home and then, you know, I'll think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, I couldn't afford that. But yeah, I just, selfishness with money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your best money habit? Uh, I have no idea what like a, what is a money habit my best my best money habit like what like what sort of thing we talk like people who save every week or like yeah or say if you're like um say I'm the kind of person who will or a certain I used to be I'm getting better but I um a bad what bad money habit is um, say like signing up for a free trial of something. Oh, the so not being able to. Oh, yeah. So that's an example of a bad money habit. So maybe a good money habit would be setting the reminder and making sure you cancel the subscription. Yeah, I think the issue with me is I don't have a lot of good money habits. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, really. Oh, one, I from what I've observed, your good money habit is that you see like abundance so you are able to go oh I don't have enough money for whatever it is that I need but you can make it happen like you can create oh yeah that is something I'm good about actually yes I I'm quite entrepreneurial and mm. if I don't have something I will try and get it in a set yeah 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 that is yes thank you I, I shall take that on board <laughs> um I think that I also think that I am pretty good again going back to the charity thing I am pretty good at um if I have excess or if, to be honest, I fall for like every appeal on the TV. So whenever I can, I'll do like a monthly thing. I can't at the moment. I had to stop my monthly subscriptions. But then there was a stand up to cancer thing on TV and then there was a comic relief thing. And I just donate whenever I whenever I see those things. So I, yeah, I suppose another good money habit is that I am, I'm always aware of trying to donate what, what, I, what I can. That's a great habit. Um, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to someone, you know, who wanted to be a 
director and was sort of starting out now? I think I would say that there is a snobbery sometimes that we have to get paid 100% of our income from one thing mm. and and that that has to be the creative thing we do and I think that there is a lot of people who have secret jobs there mm. are people who do consultancy across different industries and I think my advice would just be never to get hung up on what you need to do in order to pay your bills if that's got nothing to do with your passion or nothing to do with your industry I I I think there is a really a huge thing to be admired in people who just can need do what they need to do to live and be able to have their creative um, thing, you know, because there'll be some years where I can just work as a director. Um, and that is amazing. But I don't, I think when I was younger, God, I just saw it as such a weakness if I had to go back to temping or if I had to go back to teaching. Whereas now I see it as the biggest asset that I have those skills that I can do that. I just feel so lucky that I can, there are people I can phone to say, hey, can I come and do this for a bit? Um, or I can put a Facebook message up, say, hey, can I teach you piano for a bit? You know, so I think that would be it. That My biggest advice would be just never to worry about that stuff and just to feel proud of who you are and how you survive. That is fantastic advice. And actually, like, why I'm doing this whole project is, like, to talk about those secret jobs or those, like, yeah, other things that you have to do and be like, there's no shame in it. And it's so weird, isn't it? That, you know, there was um, Derek Bond, who's a really brilliant director, wrote a Guardian, a Guardian article like six years ago and, was, and outed himself as having a secret job. And then that started, you know, but people, even the people at the top of our industry are doing it. So unfortunately, that's the world we live in where we kind of have to, but I don't know why people feel so ashamed of it. Mm. Because they value their financial, their income, yeah and that's the I'm wrong way yeah, yeah. Worth what I make right and if, yeah. it, if it seems if I'm only making money from my creativity that must mean that I'm really creative yeah because I think yeah. I think the the like the circle that people yeah. are turning themselves into um, you're right yeah anyway that's 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 my theory um thank you so much for being on the podcast and so generously talking about your life and your money and your beliefs and your feelings I'm I really appreciate it no thank you thank you very much for having me I love your cardigan today by the way oh thank you I got it from a charity shop love it love it no thank you so much no worries thank you okay bye bye Thank you so much for tuning in to the Artists Make Money podcast. You can find us on Instagram at Artists Make Money, where you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can find me on Twitter at Vivigan41, and you can find Charlotte on Twitter at uh, Charlotte Peters with a Z. That will also be linked in our show notes. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really love it if you could rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or tell a friend. Uh, it really helps to spread the word. Being an artist is hard and making a living from it is even harder, but I believe in you. Keep going.